Uh, my name is Greg Pasenko, and I'm uh, with Blue Jazz Label and Promotions and Booking. And uh, we're here to do a little interview with uh, Mr. Steve Rodby, uh, a pretty well-known producer in the world with uh, 15 Grammys that have just, uh, he just got his latest one uh, that came in the mail today, I understand, and he'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and we're going to do an interview about uh, his producing of a Canadian, Toronto-based uh, guitarist, Galen Weston, uh, who I help manage and book and do what little magic I can for him. And uh, Steve produced his second CD uh, for us, and he has uh, done just beautiful things with it, and we'd like to talk a little bit about that process. Um, so without further ado, I've always wanted to say that on camera. Uh, Steve, how are you? I'm good. Uh, this is a real treat for me. I mean, the reason that I got involved with this music is because of Greg. He put me together with Galen. At that level, it's a kind of a thing that happens from time to time. And in a weird way, I somehow, it's only until I'm, you know, uh, hip deep in the project that I even realized, oh right, this one day someone called me and I said yes, and then all of a sudden it's happening and now it's on and it becomes, you know, a third of my year or a huge part of my life. Now I'm very open to all kinds of projects, but this one was a really special one in a bunch of different ways. Uh, you characterized it really clearly for me, uh, his 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 strengths and also the the unique, many unique features of this music, and it all turned out to be true. But then even more so on top of all that. It was a really lovely experience. You know, now the record's out. There we are. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of it. So it was a blast. It was really fun. It was a lot of hard work for all of us involved. Uh, a lot of learning and teaching for everyone involved. That's a funny phrase that usually doesn't get used with producing, but that's actually one of sort of the hallmarks of the kind of work that I do. Uh, I think, if, if I do my job right, is that we all learn a lot, but we also teach, you, teach each other a lot. So yeah, it was, a, it was a blast, and I'm real proud of the way the music came out. Galen is something else, and it, it's really, really nice. I hope people enjoy the music half as much as I have working on it. I w agree with everything you've said, and uh, the process has been a learning experience for me, working with someone who has... Um, done so much in his life right. and uh, I uh, and has been so successful at it um, I would uh, can you maybe just give a little just a, the elevator pitch on your background well um, you know it's a funny thing I mean I started out as a bass player and really like bass player not like well uh, I took piano I mean I did take piano for a minute but as soon as I started playing the bass that was it I always feel like with musicians, well, I've known a few very talented musicians where I felt like maybe they were playing the wrong instrument or something, because you kind of get stuck with whatever the teachers stick you with when you're young. But I knew from a really early age that it was bass. And I spent, you know, the uh, first few decades of my musical career really focusing on bass. But bass has this weird tendency to bleed off into producing. And I, I've seen it time and time again with bass players who, because to be a good bass player in uh, you know jazz or pop or improvised music, you aren't in the foreground, you're in the background, you're sort of organizing things, you're sort of bringing people together, you're sort of doing everything sort of undercover, it's not about you, but you're still sort of have a lot of power, but it's not about the spotlight being on you. And I think once you make your peace with that, then you are potentially bass player material, I mean, sorry, producer material as a temperament, but then comes the experience thing. Now my father was a choir director, and so I also uh, grew up thinking about helping people direct people. Direct is a little bit of a strong word for what I do, but uh, help people shape the music making part of their lives. So I was very, at a very young age very comfortable with both the, I'm, it's not about me, and yet there needs to be someone who's sort of shaping things as they go along. So, well, that kind of, that explains the last 35 years of my life. It's the, it's the damnedest thing, really. But, uh, so the thing with Galen, 
we're now in the you know in a fairly advanced stage of this part of my life where someone says uh, we'd like your help, but in, if they come to me with preconceptions about what that help's supposed to be, it often doesn't work out so well because I think a lot of artists really have never had a good producer and they don't know what that means, which isn't their fault. It's the point is is that it means about seventy five different things in seventy five different settings. So. First thing I do is try to go through with them, what are you looking for? With me and Galen, it went extremely well. It was very clear what of all the different things that I might have to offer he was looking for, and it was a perfect match. So I thought we had a really good collaboration. I thought it worked out really well. Yes, it, very successful. We, and the CD's been very successful, and it's out now. Um, I guess we should say the name of it. <laughs> the, this, we should say something about what the name of the CD is. It's The Space Between. And uh, I do all the radio and press promotion uh, for our artist, and so obviously I've been saying that name a lot lately with radio personalities and uh, press. Um, when you're producing, obviously uh, along with your background, what you said, the period of time you spent with Pat Metheny obviously put you in many different situations on stage, sound checks, different sound systems, different players. Um, and then when you moved over to the producing part, I think you did some producing uh, for him uh, that went into some Grammys one. Um, does, so that, that whole background has taught you so much about how you do your, your producing process. And we've talked about that before you started. I thought it was quite amazing that uh, all these different aspects because generally we tend to think of okay we yeah we come up with some tunes we go in a studio we kind of get everything together the band rehearses uh, engineers there we knock it out then we go back in and mix and then we master but with a record of this caliber I believe that there's so much more with somebody at your caliber working with it maybe you could well, um, uh, Greg, you know, it's funny. It's like what I often say to artists is like, okay, well, <laughs> let's break it down into five or 10 or 17 or whatever little phases. So I'm going to do use a smaller number now, but there's sort of pre-production. Um, choosing the tunes, fixing the tunes, uh, arrangements, um, casting, which, you know, film directors, which is kind of one of the more similar analogies to record producing that I can think of. Casting, everyone says casting is so important. Um, you know, the cinematographer, the recording engineers, you know, everyone involved. It's incredibly important. Um, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, but in pop music, that phase can even be writing all the songs with co-writers, recording all the tracks before the artist even shows up. Not a jazz paradigm, but more of a pop paradigm. Then there's the recording which could use some supervision. Then there's this nether zone, this kind of, it's, they call it post-production, but I call it kind of mid-production, where you take the files and you do what all the things that uh, modern technology allows us to do, and you either intervene in the music in a way that kills the soul or um, coalesces the soul. You know, it either makes it uh, uh, grittier and sweatier or it, smooths out all the rough edges and becomes boring. So obviously you can tell from that description which camp I'm in. Uh, and then there's the mixing, and after the mixing, then there's mastering, and there's also supervising mastering and supervising mixing. So what I offer to people, as many other people who are, do what I do is, is sort of this sort of like one from column A, B, C, D, E. Sometimes all I do is that middle thing where I just kind of, they've already recorded it, they're gonna mix it, do a little whatever. Sometimes I just supervise the recording. Sometimes it's all done, but they want someone with some experience to listen to the mastering and weigh in on options and so forth. So um, I'm happy to do all five things, uh, all 10 things, whatever, or two or three, or this one and that one. In Galen's case, I was pretty much hands-on, except for the pre-production aspect of it, in terms of the music. It seemed to me when I met him that he really had figured out he had this whole body of music which had not been well recorded yet, it was unrecorded. And the question was, should we do this 
or should we reinvent the wheel and go on to the next phase? Um, this is fairly common. I've had long conversations with artists about this one before we jump in. But often I feel like if there's something that you just, you need to finish it. You need to like get that out there. Then after that, you're gonna be really free to just throw caution to the wind and do the next thing. So I, I felt like that was the case uh, specifically and individually for Galen, and that's where we went. So yeah, he had the music, he had the band, he had the musicians, he had the studio. Uh, we got a, a brilliant recording engineer to come in from LA, Rich Breen, to work on it. But a lot of what we did was just capturing already what he's been up to over the last half a decade or whatever since his last record. Now, uh, this record, I feel, is uh, very progressive in a lot of ways and nudges him, you know, for the next thing. I also think, like, no, you've done this now, so let's see what happens next. But I'm really happy with the way the music came out. That's great. Steve, I remember when we were discussing this, and uh, I think it was after the, maybe in the first day of, no, it was actually, he had sent you some roughs, right. I believe, and you were listening to it, and you, for a while, you were thinking, wow, this music's kind of all over the place a little bit, but it has themes, it has, it feels like it's, uh, but it's, it's just different, and it took you a, a moment, I think, to put your head around it, but after a while, you, and I think you even said, Richard said that you became more and more attracted to it because it became, oh, this is Galen music. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's always the case. I mean, I've been really spoiled in my life working with so many <clears> artists <throat> that have such a singular point of view. So, though lots of terrific records are made in this world that are all kind of, uh, uh, you know, they have a lot of... Uh, stylistic variety almost at the expense of a singular focus, but that doesn't make them a bad record. But I'm more comfortable with making records from a specific point of view, not to, you know, arraign anything in too much. But what became clear to me was is that uh, the roughs were rough, uh, they were demos, but that there was a Galen aspect to the whole thing that tied it together. And that's all I need. I mean, I just need, you know, talent and, and, and uh, and a point of view, and then we can take it from there. And, uh, you know, if you, like I've got the record up here, if we, you know, play, if I, I'm gonna drop the needle on just a few things here, just, <laughs> just for a few seconds. But ch check this out, because it's really cool. These are the finished versions of what we ended up with. And in some ways they seem very, very different, but to me they all sound like a very particular point of view from, from a, a, an artist. Okay, so that's got that, then there's this. And then that's beautiful. So you see there's a bunch of different, I mean that's you know an unfair way to do it. On the other hand, that's probably painfully like a lot of people listen to records when they're sampling things these days. Well, particularly radio. Yeah, yeah well exactly. <laughs> so nonetheless, but you see like, okay, this guy's got some range and that again keeps me involved and committed and uh, interested. So uh, there's that. But you know, also there's a tune like this one, you know, which is very forward looking. I suspect that that's more of the direction maybe the next record will be. That was what we were on the precipice of, do we go this way or that way? And I'm never trying to push an artist backwards, but at the same time, I feel like uh, there is something like, have you done it yet? No, okay, let's do it, and then you can move on. And I think that's the point we're at, without the music seeming old or in any way like that. I, I think it came out pretty well in that regard. Well, when we were, you were done with it, and I was listening to it, and Galen was talking about how what order to put it in, it almost seems like that came through a little there yeah. in the order. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, it came out very well structured in a lot yeah. of different ways, but it was fun. I mean, you know, the thing is he's, well, you know, jazz guys like me, we use like little shorthand of stupid everyday words and we go, oh, he's got a thing. Well, that's like, that. what does that even mean? But I know what it means. Jazz guys know what it means. Uh, pop people know what it means. Uh, artists know what it means. Yeah, he's got a thing. 
So, I mean, without that, I'm lost. I could, you know, do the job as a job, but there's not going to be any love in it. There's mm -hmm. not going to be the same commitment. But he's got a thing, so you've also, we, we pursued that thing. You know, you've, you've also, I mean, with your history with Pat, but other projects you've done um, have worked with people who aren't necessarily that, what we, we tend to get, you know, genreized or whatever for a bad lack of word or categorized, but he, you've worked with a lot of artists who aren't, let's say, just this isn't a jazz record per se. This yeah. is, you know, uh, yeah. has many different aspects to it, but you're able to help cr create that uh, mesh uh, that, uh, and I know that a lot of the people you've, you have worked with have gone on to be really well accepted in the world, and I think Galen is creating uh, his own type of sound within that. Yeah, I mean, I'm so spoiled. I mean, I've said that already, you know, a couple of times today. But uh, I'm lucky. You know, one of the main ways I'm lucky is is that, you know, I haven't uh, really kind of like no one I've ever worked with has been cynically reductive in terms of playing to the marketplace. Well said. I mean, it's kind of like maybe, uh, you know, it's a singular career in that way. And I'm spoiled with the people who I'm known for having worked with, but I'm also spoiled with the people that might not be as well known that I've worked with. But it's just like, if that's what you want to do, if you want to be, you know, aiming commercially in a really narrow casting fashion, I'm not your guy. If you want to make the best record you ever made, I'll help you try to make that. I won't say we'll get there, but, or I'll, give you some other names you can work with, but that's what we're going for here. And then we hope the music will take care of itself and all the other teams involved. But it's hard to throw your heart and soul into something if it doesn't have that integrity and quality to begin with. And I'm, you know, what I hope to give to people is that kind of quality control. Without getting too technical, um, since he is, uh, he's, we've been talking about the composition aspects of Galen, but the, uh, in your process of recording, uh, he is a guitar player's guitar player. He's, I was a guitar player for years. You've worked with guitar players, fanatic about sound, tone, different sort of things. Is there? I don't know if there's anything we could really say about whether he, uh, how you recorded him and took that into consideration because the guitarist, if it don't sound right, yeah, that ain't right. Yeah. Well, there's there's a few obscure technical things we do, but the main thing is just um, I, I for some I, I don't even know why, but I get guitar players. You know, I mean, obviously, I mean, I've done so much with so many of them, and I just love them. And I don't play guitar. Lots of bass players play guitar, but I don't. Um, it's just I, maybe you know, and I like piano players and drummers and sax players and everything, you know, singers. I but maybe the two peep two kinds of things I've done most of my life are singers and guitar players. And um, uh, what we needed to do in a very short period of time was just make sure that we had what they would call in the film world coverage. You know, just make sure that we had everything we needed to be able to assemble all the elements in the end. But the details of that aren't so different with guitar than anything else. He owns a studio, has an engineer on staff, they've got good good people, good sense of what sounds good, and uh, I really leave that to the experts. Okay. And I, in a weird way, I'm, you know, I'm not an engineer producer, I'm a producer, and I count on my engineers to make it sound great. And you know, people say, what's the secret to your sound? I say, you know, hiring great engineers. So. Well, you also brought Richard <laughs> Green in, who yeah, has, right. does a lot of yeah, great so, guitar plays. But it, you know, yeah. whether you bring someone in or just work with a person there who knows the music best, that's the key to a good sound. It's not like, oh, this microphone or that DI or this thing or that amp or anything. It's different with every artist, every amp, every room you're recording in. You throw up a few things, you do a sh quick shootout, and you make good decisions, hopefully. So. Excellent. One of those things in the process of you know, taking on a, a, a gig like this is, uh, you know, are the tunes any good? I mean, obviously you want the player to be fabulous, but there's lots of fabulous players in the world who have lousy tunes and the band ain't that great. So uh, you have to calibrate all that before you sign up for something. Well, this one's really easy for me because, uh, you know, on top of Galen's playing, you know, he had really catchy tunes. 
but catchy without being insipid, which is a really tricky business, always has been in popular music slash jazz slash popular jazz music slash radio music that's jazz or jazz music that's ra whatever. He kind of nailed it in that regard, and that is very uh, helpful for me to sign up and give my heart to a project and really feel like I'm all in. Um, and then there's the band, and you know, he had these terrific musicians in Toronto. Uh, a lot of what producers do that people know that produce, producers do a million things no one knows what they do. What, you know, what they do, supposedly, which they actually don't do all that often, is they bring in some ringers, blah, 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 and all that kind of thing. And you know, uh, I'm not really big on that camp, if, unless it's necessary. And so, you know, we were able to use these absolutely terrific musicians that he has a history with, play the heck out of his music, know it well, and then the music kind of speaks for itself. It has that glue so that you can, you know, the songs, they don't play themselves, but they, it's, there's no wandering, there's no mystery, there's no being lost in the course of the tune. And if the musicians aren't lost, then the listeners aren't lost. And so those are key components for me to be willing to say, yes, I'll throw myself into this project. And Galen had that in spades, so we were good to go. Excellent. You know, uh, as we draw to a close here, uh, I'm just really grateful to have been involved in this, but it, it's, it's fun because, um, you know, artists and I, always near the end of a project, we start talking about the next one. And, you know, we're, by the time we get to mastering and mixing, we're sort of married and all this, and everyone's all promising, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. And it's great if it happens. It's great if it doesn't happen. It doesn't matter to me. But I want there to be that feeling like both we've done the best we possibly could with the task we set out to do, but also how can I help in the future? And sometimes we skip a record, sometimes it's the next record, and then it's never again because you don't want to do the same thing too many times in a row. It doesn't really matter. The thing is, this is a really, really positive experience uh, for all of us, in my opinion, and um, you know, I'm uh, thrilled with the outcome and uh, would love to do more if that comes up. But uh, you know, it's it's now family at this point. It's not it's not just the musician. So yeah. well, it's interesting you say that because I talked recently with Galen about the next record where he wanted yeah. to go, and he said, "I don't think I could ever record again without Steve Rodby." <laughs> well, so uh, we we love that, but there are plenty of other terrific people out there. But it is a kind of a process. It's a mentality. It's a set of beliefs. It's a paradigm, which is very flexible. But at the same time, we try to you know, make the best out of whatever is there, no matter who's involved or what the nature of the project is. So I am hope that uh, however his next record goes, that he can, you know, I'm sure he'll top this last one. So it'd be great. Great. Thank you. Thank you.